Hi, and welcome to the fifth installment of Overheard Orlando. Today, I will be with Corey Sims, who is an Orlando area writer who's going to be sharing some of her processes with us. She's going to share an excerpt from an untitled children's book that she's currently working on um, in collaboration with a friend of hers. And of course, she's going to be talking about her personal philosophy. Fun fact, she was a complete stranger to me who, via a mutual friend's recommendation after I suffered a somewhat last minute guest cancellation, has now found her way here to the show. So this interview was done completely cold. Uh, And what I mean by that is I have never met her. I've interviewed people I've never met before, but there was no pre-interview. We had been corresponding via DMs up until then. So I kind of went into this a little blind. Thankfully, it was quite serendipitous in the sense that everything worked out pretty great, and I think we've got a really enjoyable episode for you guys. So without further ado, we'll just go right to it. yourself because we are complete and perfect strangers yes we are but the universe is amazing because we do have a mutual connection someone who's been in my life around five years now and recommended myself to you so i mean nothing is coincidental i am a full believer in that so i'm from florida raised in the south but much much of my family is in the north And I feel like I'm just now discovering or throwing myself into the things that I've always been interested in as a girl, Uh, a younger person. I've always gravitated to nature and music and dance. But, you know, life is a funny thing. And until recently, I was able to just accept you enjoy storytelling and you're great with words and you like to talk and listen to people. And I feel like I'm discovering how I can create a life around that, you know? And I mean, life is enabled as humans through money. (laughs) There's no way around that. So I think that's the whole message with find your passion and do what you love to do. And that's, that's what I'm all about for me. I just love discovering what other people love because that excitement and energy is what makes me thrive. And I myself like to use my curiosity to just learn and soak up as much as I can because there's just so much going on in the world around us. And you don't have to travel all the way to another country or another area of the world just to feel excitement. I think that's the other thing I want to increase awareness about. You don't have to hop on a plane, but you do need to, you know, go out of your comfort zone. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm about. There are quite a few talking points in there. Going outside of your comfort zone and kind of chasing your passion, you know, it took me quite some time of trying to find myself and kind of quelling the voices of my parents to, you know, go into something go into something that I'm not really interested in, but it's going to make me a lot of money. So I should do it. Like, you know, my mom has been trying to get me to be an investment banker for so long. And mm-hmm. I just, I, I can't think of anything I would want to do less than that. <laughs> it, it's really important that people kind of accept their interest, even if the rest of the world kind of tells them it's, it's a useless. It's or wrong or you shouldn't. And I have a great example. I have a cousin right now. He's lived in Armenia, which is near Romania, Iran. So on that Eastern European side of the world for a year now, he's been there. But I remember us being together. That was the end of 2018. So it was the new year going into 2019. And so many people were opposed to him going, even his mother and just so many people he looked up to. And it really hurt him, you know, but he trudged through it anyway. He said, this is my calling. I really believe that I'm not supposed to be here. I need to be there. And I want to throw myself into 
my passion of bringing global awareness to having a better diet and uh, financial trading and throwing myself into that. That was so inspiring. His path is what I am very humble to follow. I think that's another part to life. You have to understand when to lead and when to follow. I love that last line, that yeah. when to lead, when to lead and when to follow. That is something that I think a lot of people have trouble with. And what you were saying at the beginning there, it is uh, really taxing to have a decision that you want to make and even against your own desires and your own wishes and what's true to yourself. It can be really hard when your parents or your loved ones are telling you not to do it and it's the only thing you want to do. Yes, because you we have this whole concept of tribe, right? Like my tribe and your support system. That's another way to say it. But I think um, communication is key. So if you tell someone an idea, let's say that you're, you know, you have a partner and you tell your partner what you're interested in doing in terms of business or just shifting your career or a new hobby, but maybe it's a costly hobby. Maybe that partner only sees the numbers or maybe that partner doesn't understand, you know, why you're doing it. So I think what I'm really trying to say is everyone has a different language. Everyone has a different way of learning and processing. So sometimes we don't take enough effort to translate it. You know, you're saying it the way you say it because it makes sense to you. But maybe if you took time to uh, translate it to a way someone else could understand it, they might accept it or be more accepting or their buy-in would increase. Their understanding is higher. So they're willing to be like, you know what? I understand now. I get it now, but I'm behind you 100%. In the world, misunderstanding is, I think, responsible for so much heartbreak and, and yes. un unnecessary pain. It's something in your head. It can be completely different in reality. It's really true what they say about how reality is a little different for every single individual. So you mentioned languages and kind of getting your point across to people and things like that. I did see on Instagram that you are a writer of sorts. So I know that in writing, in writing, that's kind of something that uh, you always have to keep in mind as well is, is getting your point across in such a way that it can be absorbed and understood by a wide variety of individuals. How how do you incorporate that in your writing? I think there's several factors. Number one, and, and tying it back to that, know when to lead, know when to follow. Um, I rely heavily on my research, whether that's in the form of books or screenplays or uh, novels, also interviews, uh, TED Talks. I love TED Talks because you're able to get information from the source. I learned living vicariously through others. So people who are willing to share their mistakes, share what they've learned, share what works, share what doesn't. I rely heavily on authors and writers and publishers so that they can, I can learn how can I convey my message? What is it that I am trying to say and how could it be received? Some advice I heard is that you can't be concerned about how it's received. You should not. Because when you do, you sacrifice authenticity. You sacrifice what it is that your truth really is or whatever your discovery is. When you're concerned about how someone else is processing it or how someone else is perceiving it, you're losing your connection to whatever it was that you discovered, whether that be about love or about something scientific or maybe even just an experience, you're forgetting what that is. I do my best to just simplify whatever it is that I am writing about. At the moment, much of my work is in a <laughs> building phase or a draft phase, if you will. But my messages, I do my best to make them clear. You know, what is it that I want you to know? Uh, and that's, it's, it's a formula. There are mechanics. You can't ignore that. There are mechanics. You can't just wing it. So you do have to commit to the trade 
and there's all kinds of trades out here. But when you are in the trade of writing, you can't just do your own thing. And if you notice that when people just wing it or they do their own thing, there's not a lot of reach. There's not a lot of sales. I mean, you can turn it into numbers. That's never the goal with writing, but it is measurable when you try to bypass the mechanics. You try to bypass the rules or the laws, if you will. So just keeping your message simple, knowing your audience, but also keeping your authenticity. What is it that drove you to write this in the first place? I'm doing my best to keep that as pure as possible. If you take this podcast, for example, trying to not worry so much about the perception and the way it's going to land, there are also certain rules at play that have been laid down by pioneers, the people who were doing this years when it first, when podcasting first became a thing. And there's certain rules and, and unspoken laws at play that you do kind of have to follow while also doing your own thing and not being overly concerned with the perception. So I definitely get that. It can really be trying to even out the scales, if you will, in that sense. So I, we had spoken earlier that maybe you might have a little something you wanted to read for us. Is that still on the table? Yes, it is. Um, just some context, some background. I have a best friend and we have been friends since sixth grade. How old are you in sixth grade? You're like 11. You're, you're, you're just hitting the double digits. You're right. Grade. Like you're preteen. You're just breaking into adolescence um, and puberty. So we've, we have been friends that long and we're in our late twenties now. So it's been a beautiful journey of just love and respect. Um, and we both have a passion for bringing awareness to history and origin. Where do you come from and your culture? So myself, I come from an African-American background of a family of talent. I mean, singers on my mother's side, teachers on my father's side, educators, and those are the aspects of our culture that I think are undermined. I don't think that there is commercial awareness to our contributions to what, how we live. And it's, that doesn't matter if you're Black or not. The contributions that we've made to society are undermined because of the narrative that's been written for us. Uh, just history alone, it has nothing to do with intention. It's just history. You know, because every, not every, I would say many cultures, many groups of people have been undermined throughout the world and throughout time. So we took that passion and I was at my job and I said, well, no, for months, I said, we need to write a book. We need to write a book. We need to write a book. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then finally, one day I just started writing at my desk at work. And it, the prose is more of a poem or pro, it's more poetic. You can even think of Dr. Seuss, if you will. And I handed it off to her and I said, tag team, now it's your turn. And we did this back and forth, back and forth of a plot around this young man, or maybe a younger boy, just in a city and he's in school and he has an assignment and he has to share with his class what he wants to do. You know, what do you what would you like to do in your life? What would you like to do as a career? But he is struggling with the fact that he doesn't really understand his options because the visuals or the people he's learning about, he's not connecting with. So in the book, he's going, he is traveling through a dream and meeting around seven to eight different people that she or I have never heard of before. Never heard of before. So this was such a, beautiful project because we were able to become closer to the pioneers touching back to that point the people who set a path for us to be great and i would like to read a portion of our book one moment i'm going to scroll to a part that uh okay so it won't be super long but i think it'll give you an idea of what it is that we're trying to um educate children and their parents, just all ages. Now in a room with their feet on the ground, Jamal saw tons of papers scattered around. Tall stands, large lights, cameras, and labels. Suddenly, Jed jumped up onto a wooden table. 
Come back, Jamal whispered. He was distraught. We might not be alone. You probably forgot. Indeed, someone was there. Jamal was right. A deep voice emerged that was very polite. My name is Mr. Michaud, and this is your last stop. I am here to share my talent, a, cre a creator of plots. Jamal looked around but could not see who this voice could possibly be. So he climbed the table to join his pup, and there in plain sight was the friendly grown-up. Plots? Like in a book? Jamal inquired. Oscar answered, yes. I write movie scenes when I am inspired in my prime time between 1919 and 1948. African Americans were stopped at the gate at public venues like a theater or diner and were not allowed to take a seat to watch eat to watch movies along a white elite. Every brown or dark skin role was cruel. There were either a slave or a downright fool. So I write I wrote over 40 films that better portrayed African American men and women wrongfully played. I had low budgets and sold stock to raise money. I went to Europe and South America for support. Isn't that funny? That sounds like a lot of work, Jamal admitted with a frown. Did you ever feel discouraged? Did you ever feel down? Of course I did, but goes with, but that goes without saying. I kept pushing because it was not only me who was paying. You have to understand your choices affect more than you. It is important to stay strong no matter what lies ahead. Bark! Jed agreed as Jamal nodded his head. And most importantly, you must know you will not and cannot succeed on your own. Even if you are me, a man ahead of his time, every great or icon knows help is success's paradigm. Did you always have help? Jamal asked. I sure did. My wife, Alice, in a brilliant all-black cast. If you try to succeed on your own, you will surely be last. Lean on loved ones that never steer you wrong. Their support will help you and keep moving right along. Jamal knew his parents would support his wishes for sure. The fact alone made him feel loved and secure. Wow, Jamal reflected. It's clearer than ever before. We were and we are and we always have been and more. That was amazing. That was really good. I, I actually quite enjoyed that. I appreciate that. It's the, you know, I think visualization is so powerful. I think that's the sad part about wanting to put imagery in a book. I mean, yes, you want, you need pictures for children. Children need that. But to see it in your mind, I think that's, that's when it's effective. So I don't know if you can share, like, did you, what did you see while I was talking? I think that's most important to be able to see what you're hearing. I definitely got a sense of whimsy, kind of like a, a Dr. Seuss book would, yeah. would give me, but also with some of the more serious real life tones going on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, that was, that was really good. I, I quite enjoyed that. I appreciate it. So we're yeah. we're still in the works of this, just some fine tuning, and uh, it's definitely a process I'm discovering with um, putting out a book. I think the more effort you put in on the front end, the less. Um, I think the more impact you can make because if you don't comb through your product, and that's a book, it could be anything. It could be an invention. It could be a service. If you don't comb through it in the front end, then you're going to experience low success. So, for example, I heard about, I think it was a TED Talk that someone was sharing with me, or maybe they read something about an app production. So this team, they had a great idea. They put in all this money, all of this developer money all of the graphic design and sales and all these different things, but the app plummeted. No one picked it up. It didn't achieve the numbers that they were projecting. And the question was why? But the problem was that they put so much worry and so much effort into their own idea without getting the anecdotal input. Instead, I think what people don't, understand is that you don't need to develop an app 
in the beginning, if you have an app idea, you can literally create PowerPoint slides or PDF pages of a prototype of what it would possibly be, and then put it in front of your groups, your focus groups, and just get their input. You know, would they find this helpful? Would they use this? What do they like? What do they not like? And you can use these iterations to help prove what you want to do. And then the moment you get to true coding, it's smooth and your production time to market is much shorter and you will yield those, that participation and that measurement of acquisition much sooner <laughs> and more effectively. So that's where we're at, just combing through, working with different people, illustrators, publishers, just trying to figure out the right relationship. Similar to what you were saying in your, or rather similar to what you mentioned in your excerpt, getting help is paramount to success. It's almost undeniable. You really can't do it on your own. And I just think that when there's some participation going on, you're just bound to have a much better result. Yes. Yes, no man is no island. And there's so many roles, whether you want to call them stakeholders or, you know, it's all the same. You can't do it on your own. And I myself am going back to my own basics. You know, in college, they tell you, you need a mentor. And I don't know what the rate is. I have no idea what numbers are. But just for myself, I stopped that relationship of a mentor. I think that's very important to have someone in your life who has achieved what you wish, you know, they are in a place that you are hoping to get to. And that role is someone who can help you formulate what you intend to experience. So you can't do it alone. <laughs> if you try, you're going to keep hitting a wall. <laughs> can't do it alone. It could even be said you can't exist outside yourself. You're going to keep hitting that wall because it is a product of your own limitations. And through the help of somebody else who can get you around it or maybe see it from a different perspective or a different point of view can just be endlessly helpful. So on this podcast, I guess the unifying theme would be philosophy or a personal philosophy. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about yours or. Yeah. And I love that because I reflect even in that instantaneous moment of hearing your question, because my philosophy has changed. It's changed more rapidly in these recent years than I would say earlier 20s for sure. My current philosophy is, you know, don't accept your own bullshit. Don't accept your own bullshit. And that opens, you know, the mind to so many other questions or thoughts because we are the decisions that we make. We really are on a daily basis. So what do you choose to do on a daily basis? Not only what you spend your time on and no way around it, all of us, all of us spend a lot of our time at work right? We spend a majority of our day working. So what are you doing when you're not working? And what type of work do you do? Those things checking in with yourself, you know, don't accept your own bullshit. Are you denying that you don't enjoy what you do? Are you denying that, you know, this isn't what you see yourself doing in 10 years? Because if the answer is no, then it's your responsibility to change it. No one is going to hold your hand and give you a blueprint and give you money and tell you what to do. That's the reality. You have to steer your own ship. And sometimes that's really rough. It is, but most ships have a crew. And so you have to choose the best people to, to get you there. And that's what I've learned. I have recently learned to lean on my friends, lean on experts or family members who are stronger in areas that I'm not. So that way I don't have to accept my own bullshit. I can allow someone to help me change it, allow someone to help me heighten my strengths. And so I can be kinder to my weaknesses across the board, whether that's work or uh, I personally enjoy dancing. 
So just getting back into ballet and making sure that I'm having more movement and getting in tune with my body. And then the biggest challenge is the uh, food piece of it. So that's a whole conversation I'm willing to get into, but the philosophy is don't accept your own bullshit, especially with what you choose to eat, what you choose to consume, because that has a much bigger impact on us than we really understand as a common people. Commercially is what I like to say, because commercially, there's not a lot of support in that area. So not accepting your own bullshit and letting people help you in that. Well, we may have to have you back on just for <laughs> a completely separate episode on the wellness side. I had kind of wanted to touch on it, but we're already kind of on a longer than normal runtime. So okay, we're gonna yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have you back for that one <laughs> at some point. I'm we more could, than happy. <laughs> we could even do another episode on the lies that we tell ourselves and the bullshit. Oh uh, yeah, we shouldn't believe because that's that's a whole nother episode there. On that note, though, is there anything else you'd like to say before I wrap this up? You know, I it's such a unique time. And, you know, those folks that you, you are going to reach with your podcast, uh, no matter where you are, who you are, we're kind of all experiencing the same thing at the moment with our quarantine requirements and just the unpredictability, the ambiguity. It's a very gray time. We don't know what's what's on the horizon. So in that space, I just, I hope that everybody chooses to remain informed, do your best to be informed. And that means being curious about accurate information and arming yourself with that information because fear is a means of control. And if you take things at first by face value, right? You don't dive deeper. You don't ask questions. You have to. You have to. Don't take things for face value because it's it's an old saying. You believe nothing you hear in half of what you see. Believe nothing you hear in half of what you see. So we have to maintain that strength uh, and just choose to move forward no matter what it looks like because this will pass, right? We we shouldn't let it control our lives and control how what we believe. <laughs> Don't ever let it control that aspect of your inner spirit. Well, Corey, thank you so much. This has been a very enjoyable interview. And, uh... <laughs> thank you for having me. I I really love what you're doing. I think that this is a great thing, and the folks listening will absolutely have a benefit to the messages that you want to share. So I appreciate it. The pleasure is all mine. Thanks. We'll have to have you back. All right. Well, that was a most enjoyable interview. It's really quite crazy that we started that interview out as complete strangers and we're ending it, I'd like to think, as friends. As per usual, you can follow me on Instagram at Overheard Orlando Podcast. Um, shoot me an email at Overheard Orlando Podcast at gmail.com. I do plan to increase the social media presence of the podcast. And with that being said, we are also now on Facebook, which I will be uh, creating some content for that as well. Some videos, some pictures, things of that nature. So do keep a lookout for that. Well, that's pretty much going to do it for me. Stay safe and stay true. <laughs>